National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect. Okay, so I see folks are still streaming in, but it is noon slash nine, depending on where you are, so let's hit the ground. Welcome to the 2022 India Can Summer Training Series. Uh, during the presentation, if you have a question that comes up, please submit it into the Q&A box. Uh, there's also a chat feature, but we try to put all the questions in the Q&A so that we have a transcript of them in order to turn it into our series at the end of the summer, our webinar series. Uh, also, as a reminder, this session is being recorded. If you are new to us, the summer training series um, is obviously run live. Uh, but we turn it into a webinar series that gets put on the website at the end of the summer. Um, and so that's the reason that we record them. And uh, if you have any questions about our data that kind of aren't covered in this summer series, I recommend looking at our website because we have the prior summers. Um, everyone seems to be here on Zoom okay, but if you're having trouble, you know, I think there's a lot of Zoom support. And then also Andres, who is the one who organizes these lovely events for us, uh, can also provide support. Is there next? Great, so as I said, this is the MDA CAN Summer Training Series. Uh, this is a series of workshops we host every summer. At the end of the summer, you will get an evaluation survey from me. You know, we really like getting feedback from folks that helps us improve the series, but it's also how we pick all the topics for the following series. So, you know, all the topics that are covered in this summer training series are actually recommendations from folks who attended last year. Uh, it's hosted by the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect. We are a data archive co-hosted at Duke and Cornell, and we make data accessible on child abuse and neglect for the research community, and then help folks uh, with some additional training like the events you see here today. This summer's theme is the power of linking administrative data. So this is the overview of the summer. Um, as you can see, today is our second session. Uh, it, we're going to be talking about linking and some administrative data. I'm going to be doing kind of a brief overview of the administrative data to start and then passing it to Sarah, who's going to talk more specifically about linking our administrative data set um, to another one of our administrative data sets and then doing a live walkthrough uh, in order to give kind of the most time for the workshop. It'll be a quick overview of the administrative data, but we did do more in-depth sessions in the 2019 summer training series. And Alexandra is going to be putting a link to that training series in the chat. So if you hear something about the administrative data, but you have more questions, I recommend checking out those longer sessions. Thank you, Alex. Great, so as I said, the agenda is I'll start by talking about some of NDA against administrative data, and then Sarah will go through the linking steps and kind of the process or theory of linking, and then that live walkthrough will be in R. So our administrative data holdings. So administrative data are data that are collected for non-research purposes. In the context of child abuse and neglect, these are collected by the government agencies or large organizations that really manage the actual administration of the child welfare system in the United States. And these uh, records are usually really developed for record keeping rather than for statistical analyses. Uh, but since all these data already exist, we can really harness the power of these large data sets to study child abuse and neglect. We have three administrative data sets. The first is NCANS, and this covers the child protective history of youth. We also have AFGARS, which covers their time in foster care. And then for those who, you know, start to age out, they're identified at age 17. Um, if, they're, if these youth do not find a permanent placement and they're likely to age out without that, um, then, you know, we capture them in another data set called the Transition Out of Care or NIDA data set. And so these youth are, are you know, really started at, at 17 if they're identified as likely to age out. And then there are two follow-up sessions. Um, and there's also information about the services they receive while aging out. And one really interesting feature of these three data sets is that they can be linked together. So for any child that appears both in NCANS or AFGARS, so they have a child protective history and a foster care experience, we can match that youth. Um, and then for the youth who eventually turn 17 and are identified as likely to age out without finding a permanent placement, we can actually trace them all the way back through their child protective and foster care histories. And so these three data sets really cover kind of the three phases of the child welfare system. So NCANS is the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. It was created as a voluntary system. And these are case level data that were collected for all children who received a response from a child protective service agency in the form of an investigation or an alternative response. 
There's a file containing child specific records for each report of alleged child abuse and neglect that received a CPS response. Complete reports that resulted in a disposition or finding uh, during each reporting year. And for the report child pair, there's an in-camps record that has a report ID and a child ID, which uniquely identifies a single record within a fiscal year. And so here's the types of variables that are in the report variables and the child variables. And again, if you know this seems like a data site you might want to use, you want to know more about, I recommend checking out the series we did that goes more in depth on this data. Uh, but there's report data, there's information about the child, uh, there's maltreatment type, there's a few examples there, there's child risk factors, um, and then for child variables, there's also the caregiver risk factors, services, perpetrator data, and then some additional fields um, that we find people often use in research and wanted to highlight. There's also an agency file. These are CAPTA required items in their state level summary data like prevention services, referrals and reports, additional information on child victims, child fatalities, and then Part C of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act reporting. So AFGARS is the next um, data set that we're going to talk about. And again, both of these received more in-depth trainings in, in 2019. So, you know, I highly recommend checking out that link from Alexandra if you have more questions about what's in these data. I will also say that on our website, we have code books for these data sets. So if you want to know if a specific field or variable or type of variable is available, I recommend starting with either the 2019 series or actually looking at the code book itself. So for AFGARS, this is going to be data for youth while they're in foster care. This is case level information on children who are under placement in and the care responsibility of welfare agencies. And basically states compile information for their electron electronic records system and send it to Children's Bureau. And then Children's Bureau works with states to correct errors in that data. And these variables will include things like demographic information, removals, placements, and other case related information. These are some common variables that folks use, date of birth of the child, caretaker of the child, and the foster and adoptive parents. There is self-identified race information on the child and foster parents. There's the date of first and most recent removal, total number of removals and discharge date, date of placement, number of placements, placement location, and then things like the case plan goals, termination of parental rights, and sources of federal financial support. So if we're working with multiple years of AFGARS, um, you can stack the different years or link these data together. When more than one year of a foster care file is used, there'll be duplicate AFGAR IDs or the state FCID. The, a child has a record for each year that they're in foster care. Um, if some of you have been with us for a while, Sarah Cernacker, who's gonna be leading the second half of today's session, also led in office hours about how to stack the AFGARS files, and that'll be likely something that comes up in a future office hours as well. And we have NIDID, um, and this is, you know, really coming from the John H. Chafee Foster Care Program for Successful Transition to Adulthood, and it aims to improve outcomes for youth in foster care who are likely to age out without funding that permanent placement. And so the law requires states track services provided to youth and outcomes um, in order to look at, you know, how these different services are potentially helping these youth. And so beginning at age 17, youth in foster care are surveyed voluntarily every other year until age 21. Uh, we have cohorts from multiple fiscal years. Um, and so we have, I think, now two full cohorts with all three waves. And so each child has three waves of data, if they part, or young adult in this case, has three waves of data. And the information is in a different file about the services they used. And so those three waves are going to be more outcome data, like if the youth has experienced um, homelessness in that time, whereas the service variables will be more about um, if they, you know, received academic supports. So now I'm going to pass it over to Sarah. Thank you, Erin. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Cerniker. I'm a statistician with Endican. Um, so I'll be doing the second half. So Erin's given a really good introduction, pretty brief on our admin data. But as she's also mentioned, um, we have had presentations in the past about linking data, specifically our admin data. Um, so as she has referenced, uh, there is a link to previous years um, to help add more context and information about the data sets themselves and also probably different perspectives on linking. Um, 
So now the linking half. Um, before we get into linking the admin data specifically, I'm just going to go over an a brief overview of what linking entails and why you might want to link. Um, and so when we talk about linking data, all we're really saying is at the very least, you have two data sets. And within these two data sets, they have some similar attributes. So let's say you have two data sets with measurements at the state level. Okay, so maybe one is like health information and the other is population information. And you want to link them so that they're just in the same place and that you can utilize them both, the, both pieces of information at the same time. Um, and so, for instance, in that simple example, the linking variable would be state because that's the common denominator between the data sets. Um, so that's like the general purpose of linking. Um, and it is very handy in general, not just using our data. So. When you're linking data, as I said before, if you're linking data, that means you have at least two sets of data, two data sets that usually are different data files, um, and you just wanna put them together. You wanna put all the data in the same data set um, to do some analysis. And so this is just general steps. This is not specific to our data, but if you're linking, you should First, consult codebooks and user's guides, and that is just in general. Anytime you use data and any place, anytime, you should always have your codebook and user's guide open um, just to get an understanding of the data itself, how it was measured, how categorical variables are measured, things like that. So once you have an understanding of the data, you have in mind how you want the data to look, what you want your link data to look like, you need to clean and prepare your data to get to that linking step. And this is important because, especially if you have large data sets, which sometimes ours can be if you're working with a lot of years, um, it may even hinder your computer. Like your computer might have a hard time dealing with the raw uncut data. Um, and also you need to clean your data to make the two data sets um, compatible. So like if you have information from both that overlaps, um, you want to make sure that they're consistent um, and make sense. So a few steps I've included here, like you would want to narrow your data to only include variables of interest. So just throwing away variables that really are not going to add to your research. They're just going to get in the way. They might have unintended consequences with linking, which I'll get into a little more. Um, so that's the first point, narrowing your focus to variables of interest. Um, similarly, filtering your data to your scope of interest. For instance, if you're only interested in certain years, certain geographies, or certain groups of people, for instance, if you're only interested in analysis on New York, there's no sense in keeping all the other states. Again, it's just computationally easier. Things might get in your way in ways that you um, may not have accounted for. Um, so again, narrowing your data not only to variables, but to the scope of interest. Um, and what I was getting at before, so standardizing variables that may be linked, maybe in one data set, your states are listed in abbreviations, and you're, in the other data set, they're listed as state FIPS codes. To you as a human, you know that that's the same thing, they're states, but your programming language and your computer will not know that they're the same unless you standardize it. So like one data set needs to either be abbreviations or sorry, they both need to have abbreviations or they should both have FIPS codes. Um, so standardizing variables to enable linkage, but also um, just the data sets themselves, making sure that categories are consistent with what you know and understand and any of the other data sets you might be using. Um, and then missing value codes are always an issue. Um, a lot of our data include like 99 instead of missing. And so those are things you should be aware of um, so that if you were to run a model, your programming language does not see 99 and think that that's a valid code when it should be missing. So that was a long spiel for cleaning, uh, but I will say in any project, I say cleaning and preparing your data is more than half the work almost every single time. So that is not a step to be taken lightly or skipped over. That's really a lot of. Um, thoughtful research processing and preparation goes into this step. 
So once you have your data cleaned, you have two data sets at least that you want to link, you clean them all, you understand, you want to, you know what they want to look like. So then you need to collapse or resolve your data. So what I mean by this is when you're linking data, you should be linking with one variable. So in the example I gave, you'd be linking on states, but sometimes data does not come as one row per linking variable. For instance, maybe in the states data, this basic example that I keep going back to, maybe you have multiple observations per state, maybe multiple rows per state, um, maybe it's over multiple years and you're only linking on data that has a single year. So you would need to collapse the data that has multiple rows per state to one row per state. And that's just going to facilitate your linking. Um, it especially helps in the context of our data because our data are usually given at the child level. Um, and usually people are interested in state level analyses or county level. And so in that context, you'd be collapsing data from an, an, in, an individual level to state level information. Um, but we'll get into that a little more with the example too. Um, and so rename linking variable to be consistent. So this is kind of what I meant before. If you had different data types, let's say in one data set, your variable's name state, and the other it's st. Again, your programming language is not going to know. Your programming language is going to think that those are two different variables. So simply making sure that your variable to be linked on is named the same between the data sets. Um, and then I find it helpful to, once you've gone through these steps, you've cleaned your data, you've collapsed it, you've made sure all the variable names are as they should be. I like to save a clean data set as the new data set. So like you have your old raw one, your big one, and then you have your like data set ready for linkage. Um, and again, that is for computational reasons, you have a smaller subset of data that's ready for for linking and it just gets like all the other junk out of the way. So you can just use your linking ready data set. So you're ready to link and you know you want them to be linked, but how does it work? Um, and I keep saying linking, but um, people also use the term joining and joining, I bring it up here because joining um, is sometimes more often found in the programming language functions. For instance, in R, they call it a join. Um, and so these are completely interchangeable. When I say linking or joining, it just means the same thing. Um, and so there's different ways to join data. And I have a nice visualization on the next slide. But the point is you have one data set and you want to link it with another. And one data set might have more years than your other data set. One um, might not be able to match on some of the values. And so you might get missing values in some variables um, when they can't be linked. Um, and hopefully this is all, this will all become more clear with the example and with this nice figure. So what I mean by different types of linking. Think of table one as one data set and table two is another data set. What's called an inner join is when you take these two data sets and you join them, but you only keep what was found in both. So let's say in one data set, it's missing DC and Puerto Rico. And in the other data set it has DC, all 50 states and DC and Puerto Rico. If you did an inner join, your final data would have all 50 states. It would not include DC or Puerto Rico because that was not found in both tables. So an inner join only keeps what can be linked from both tables. Okay, so that's the inner join. And then we have left join and right join. And these are basically the same thing. It's just, you know, holding table one and joining table two verse, and then vice versa. So it's just kind of two sides of the same coin. So let's just focus on left join. So in left join, you're saying I have one data set and I want to bring in this extra data, but maybe that's like auxiliary information. It's not as important. You want to keep all of your data from one table and just add what you can from the second table. So you're saying keep everything from my first table and just link what you can from the second table. So it's, it may not take everything from the second table. It's just going to keep what was linked. So if the other table could not be linked to the first one, 
the observations from table two that could not be linked would just be dropped. Okay, and then similarly with a right join. Um, then a full outer join is what I like to do because this says I want to link the data and keep all of the observations. It doesn't matter if they linked between the two or not, um, just keep everything. And why I like this is because sometimes with these inner or left joins, they can have unintended consequences or you could lose information um, you didn't really want to and it was just on accident. With this full outer join, you're keeping all observations from both tables and then you could see where the missing values are. Like if there's a variable from table two that was not linked with table one, they'll just have missing values and then you can observe, okay, I have these values for my table two rows, but for table one, it's just missing. Um, and so that's like informative on its own. And then you don't lose data. And in the end, you can filter out once you do this full outer join, you could then, you know, filter out to essentially the other joins um, what they would yield. So those are all the different types of linking. And I wanted to introduce this also if you're having trouble with joining, like practically programming. Um, these are terms that you could Google when you're programming. Google is your friend. Um, and so, again, these are just terms that are commonly used in programming language that you could Google um, if you're trying to figure that out and running into problems. So you're ready to make the link. You understand. You know which type of link or join you want to do. How do you actually do it? Um, luckily, most common programming language do it really simply. In Stata, it usually comes down to one line of code. You use the function merge. Um, there's a few specifications, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, in R, there is a also a merge function. Um, I have two bullets here. There's a base R function. So if you've just downloaded R, you know nothing about R, this is probably what you would use. If you're a little more familiar with R and you know what the tidyverse is, it's just a set of really nice functions within R. Um, and they have some nice uh, functions. Notice it's exactly named left join, right join, full join, inner join, um, as I introduced. And I prefer tidyverse, so that's what our examples are going to be in. So um, we'll dive into that shortly. Um, in SPSS, there's this match files function. And I think I did a, a linking talk two years ago now, and it was in SPSS. Um, so if you're trying to link in SPSS, that would be on our website from two years ago it was. And then in SAS, um, there's the data uh, statement merge. So all pretty similar. Um, I can't think of another language you might be using. Um, Hopefully this covers most of what everyone here uses. Um, and if you ever have problems with these, uh, start with your help function. So if you're within these programming languages and aren't sure how to use the function, um, you can always use the documentations or should be your first place to start. Okay, so I've gone through the overview um, and now I have an actual example. So with the context of our data. So this is all within the context of our admin data. So let's say you want to link AFGAR's foster care and the NCAN's child file. So let's say we want to link AFGAR's foster data from 2020 to NCAN's child file from 2015 to 2020. Let's say you have a research interest of looking at children who were in foster care in 2020, and you want to understand maybe risk factors. Oh, I have a why here. Want to understand history of maltreatment and risk factors in the last five years leading up to what happened to the children who are currently in foster care in 2020. Um, so yeah, that might be a valid research question. You're trying to understand maltreatment history from our NCANs and understand how that might affect a child in foster care, which is coming from our AFGARS data. So NCANs, as Aaron briefly described, comes in data, it comes in the form as one data set per year, and the data are organized by child report and um, what is it? Child report 
I think that's it. Within a year, you have one unique row per child and report. So a child could show up multiple times within the year if they are on different reports, and you could have multiple children on the same report. So NCANS takes a minute to sit down and think of the structure. It's a little tricky. Um, so that's NCANS. So step one would be aggregate years of NCANS into one data set. So we want to collapse the five-year span of information into one row summary, in essence, per child by 2020. So we want to aggregate all of the NCANS data into one row per child, summarizing their maltreatment and risk factors over the past five years. So that's the first step in NCANS. Next, uh, we would need to clean NCANS and AFCARS. Um, since we're only working with one year of AFCARS and one child only shows up once in the AFCARS file in a year, um, you don't need to worry so much about the aggregating step in AFGARS. Um, it looks like my second step two was what I was discussing in step one. Um, oh, I think my step one just meant to put all the years together. So if you, sorry, this is, a, this is like taking a step aside. So the NCANs, if you were to order NCANs from us, you would get individual files per year. And if you wanted to put them all into one data set, you could simply just stack them all. Um, it's not really linking at that point because you're just basically stacking one data on top of the other. So that would be aggregating, then you would clean it. And then as I was discussing before, you would wanna collapse the NCANs to one row per child, and then it would be ready to link with AFGARS. So um, I've actually gone through the steps one and two, because those are not, for a few reasons, it's not trivial. It took some time that we did, I could not fit into this chat or this, this presentation. Um, and second, I, Simplify the data to protect um, what's in our data. Our data is sensitive, and we really do not want any disclosure risk. So I went in, aggregated, clean, and collapsed. Um, or no, I didn't collapse. Uh, I've altered the data um, from what you would um, receive from us. I'm sorry, I'm just skipping over to the code here. Um, yes, so that's all to say I've done some processing, but I just wanna jump in to show you all what I mean. So let me take a beat. We're in R right now. I've jumped into R um, pretty abruptly, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and I'm not gonna give really too much background in the R. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the time to go over kind of the basic programming steps. So this kind of assumes a little bit of familiarity with programming. Um, you don't necessarily need to know R, but a little programming I think will help um, understand what's happening here. Um, so first let's just run some of this. So I'm setting my working directory just to where my files live. Uh, so I'm gonna run that. And then I'm loading libraries that I'm gonna use. So as I mentioned before, briefly, um, I'm going to be using some functions from what's called the tidyverse library. And this is really, this is a little contentious. Some people really love the tidyverse and I love the tidyverse. Um, and some people really don't. Um, there's definitely a learning curve, uh, but I really prefer it because I think it makes code a little easier to digest. And once you can get used to the syntax, I think it actually makes things easier. Um, so I'm gonna load that. And then data table is a nice package to load um, data. So it, it includes this function fread. And what it does is just really, it just reads data faster than the normal built-in functions. And this can help if you're dealing with large data sets, um, it'll just be read into your program quicker and easier um, without any snags. And if you did not already have these libraries, you would need to install them. So just take a step back. If you needed to install, for instance, tidyverse, this is the syntax it would look like. Install packages. Um, and then you might get this. I'm gonna just exit out because it's already in there. 
Um, any pop-ups you get for R about installing packages, uh, I just click OK. It's all kosher, safe. I've never had any issues um, downloading packages or anything nefarious in that way. OK, so we're in the working directory. We have our library set. Now we're just going to load the data. So right, we're ready for linking. We have our NCANs and AFGARs. So what I'm doing here is I'm reading in the data. I'm telling R that if there's any if there's any value that says null, so literally in the data, if you see the value null, that should just be missing, right? Like we as humans know null means no data, nothing's there. But we need to tell R to fill in missing for those because R will just take them as character values. Um, and then what I have here is called the pipe. So this is where the tidyverse um, pops up right away. So with the tidyverse, the quirk of the tidyverse is you have these piping operators. And what this does is it kind of allows you to just pile on functions to data. So here I'm loading in the data and then I'm telling R, okay, take my loaded in data and now apply this function to it. And what is this function? Rename all my variables to lowercase. Just makes it easier and you don't have to worry about case sensitive or like changing uppercase to lowercase. So that's just kind of a preference I have. So I'm loading in the data, I'm telling R, I'm not done with it yet, run it through my next function. That's what the pipe is doing. And rename all my variables to lowercase just because Sarah likes it like that. That's truly all the only reason I have it here. Um, so I'm going to run this. OK. Notice this is a pretty big data set. And this is so this is over five years. This is a subsample. As I said, I've done some processing. It's only 22 variables. But if you were to order the data directly from us, I think it's like 140 variables. Um, so these are just things to be aware of. Like if you were to go order the data from us now, it's not going to look like this. It's going to look a little messier, um, but kind of the same. Okay, so I've loaded in the data. And with R, it's nice. You can see in your environment, I have my AFGARs, I have my NCANs. You can get a little summary. Okay, this is how many observations I have. This is how many variables. Um, but what I remember, what I recommend doing is just do a quick check. So down here, just in the console, I have highlighted um, this head function of NCAN. So that's going to give you the first six rows by default. And this is great. Once you load data in, you should always look at it. Doesn't matter. Even if you know exactly what it looks like, you should just look at it as soon as you load it in because you want to make sure nothing's gone wrong. Um, cause sometimes things just unexpectedly go wrong with the computer. So this is just to make sure, okay, I've got my variables. I have report source here. This is what I've chosen, um, behind the scenes. So we have report disposition, whether the maltreatment was confirmed or not. Um, we have the child sex, um, the living. So I think that's where they're currently living. So for instance, foster care family or um, congregate care, um, Tramal and the Mal one love. So these are the different maltreatments a child could have experienced and they could have experienced up to four maltreatments on one report. Um, and then we have some risk factors. So I have um, alcohol, drug, risk factors in here, um, also race and year. So as I said, this is 2015 to 2020. So notice we have a bunch of different years um, and children from different years. We are observing the same child sometimes over different years, or in this case, in the same year. So notice rows one and two is the same child as indicated by the state foster care ID. Um, and it's within the same year. And that's because, so that means this child showed up on two reports in the same year for maltreatment. Um, and so that's why the NCANS needs um, a bit of extra time for processing because it does have this tricky structure. Um, and just to reiterate, this has been processed. These are falsified. These are not real. These are not true state foster care IDs. I have altered these. Um, these are not even the correct state 
or data, they have been adjusted to mask um, identity even further. But this is the type of data you would see. This is like a simplified, clean subset of the data if you were to order it from us. Okay, so that's NCANs. And let's take a peek at AFGARs. So AFGARs, I think I removed the date variables, but I think otherwise I left everything. Again, the state foster care ID has been altered. These are not true values. Um, so I'll just add that caveat. So this is AFGARs ID. We're just checking our variables. Notice we have some NAs um, here and there. Notice we have 99s. As I noted before, that in some variables, that is our placeholder for missing values. So this 99 is not a true 99. This is a placeholder for a missing value. There's no information here. Um, so this 99 should not be taken. This should not be used um, in any sort of analysis. Okay, so all we've done is load data and we're just making sure our data look good. We understand our data. This is what we expected when we loaded it in. That's all we're doing here. Okay, so now the next step was to clean the data. So I did a little bit of cleaning, but I left some for fun and for demonstration purposes. Um, and it looks like I had already written head. Um, so I was already past Sarah, was looking out for future Sarah. So I did head. Um, another function I like to run is summary. So again, just understanding your data. Summary will give you summary statistics over every variable. And this is nice because this will tell you min and max. So you can identify which variables have that 99 placeholder, which variables have missing values and how many. Um, and it just is a good check to make sure, you know, like if you expected one variable to be zero ones, the min should be zero and the max should be one. And that's just, you know, sanity checks to make sure. So for instance, min is zero, max is one. That's a zero one variable. So this is all just to make sure again, that your data look good and as it should be. Just because your code runs does not mean it's right. And so these are the checks that you should do to make sure things are right. And then the last little summary code I'm gonna introduce is just this string. And this is to get a sense of what the data types are. And this is important because, for instance, if you're trying to link, for instance, on, let's say, a state FIPS code that is, should be numeric. A state FIPS code is just a numeric code for each state. It's a standardized um, value that all states have, one through, I think, 56. Um, but anyway, so if your state FIPS code in one data set is a character and your state FIPS code in another data set is a, is a numeric value, you won't be able to link on them because your programming language is gonna say they're incompatible. So these, again, are just checks you're doing to make sure your data is ready by the time you link it, it should be ready to go and is gonna link how you expect it to. Um, so again, like I said, this cleaning process, I've been in R for 10 minutes and we haven't even gotten to like any sort of linking. So like these are important steps that take time and are not like the fun need of meat on the bone, but like need to be done. Okay, so those are the three summary, head, summary, string. Okay, just understanding your data, you need to clean it. So we've identified missing values um, and missing placeholders. There's not really much else to clean here. So the only thing I'm gonna clean for our data is set missing codes to NA. So I wanna set any variable that has a 99. Um, and this is with consultation from the code book. Sometimes 99 is valid, but sometimes, but in our case, in our data, 99 almost always stands for missing. Um, also, you'll learn from the code book some uh, some variables have nine as the missing code. For instance, child sex or these risk factors, a nine is not a valid um, number. It just is another placeholder. So again, this is all information you would pull from your code book. Okay, so let's take this step by step. So I'm taking NCANs. What I want to do is set any placeholder for missing to just missing. 
because it will interfere with any sort of analysis you want to do. Um, so I'm telling R, okay, take my data set and cans. I'm going to mutate some variables, right? So this is my pipe. I'm saying, take this very, take this data set, and we're going to mutate at these specific variables. And I've chosen these specific variables because, let me scroll up a little bit. If you look at the summary, these were the variables I identified with the summary. I don't know if I did a summary. Yeah. These are the variables I identified with summary that have that 99 values. So report source, notice, report disposition, child living. Um, so this is just systematically, I've gone through um, in R and in the code book and just by knowing the data um, to change which variables I know um, use 99 as a placeholder. So that's what I'm saying. You take these variables that use 99 as a placeholder, okay? Take those variables only. If they equal 99, so this period is taking, is like the placeholder for our variables now. So if any of these, it's gonna go through each variable. So if report source equals 99, set it to NA. Otherwise, just leave it as it is, it's fine, right? Cause if it's not NA, if it's not 99, then it's valid, okay. So it's going to go through each of the variables listed here and replace all those. Similarly, I'm mutating this set of variables. It's separated because they don't use 99 as a placeholder, they use nine. So I'm saying, okay, these variables, if they equal nine, set them to missing, otherwise they're fine, leave them be. Um, and that's why I have this mutate twice um, over different sets of variables. So again, this is all fancy code just to replace 99s and 9s with NAs. Um, so I'm going to run that. Um, and before I run that, I just want to, again, point out, look at our summary. We have these maxes of 99s. There's no missing in these variables here. Um, so let me just run this. And then we're going to do summary of NCANS2 down here in my console. Just again, make sure it did what we want. Notice report source, max is 88. That's, if you look in the code book, that's a valid code. We have more NAs now. I don't think we had any before. Um, report disposition, that's another one we changed. The max is now five and we have missing values. So again, every time you run something and I've been programming for years, I do basic checks like this. Just because it ran doesn't mean it made it did what you wanted. You have to check that it did what you want. Um, so again, just being really thorough here. So that was all NCANs. I'm gonna kind of fly through AFCARS because it just does the same thing. We're just again, just is just a general cleaning step um, for demonstration purposes. This is like one cleaning step that you would probably have to do um, out of many that I've already done beforehand. So you would do your summary. So I've done NCANs, now I wanna do AFCARS. I can delete this, Sorry. I don't wanna confuse. We're using the same function here. I've identified these variables that use 99 as a placeholder. And I'm saying if they equal 99, make them missing, otherwise they're fine. Another thing I've done is when you do linking in R, um, it's not like other data program, other programming languages, which will tell you which values will link. Um, you kind of just have to observe by either missing or um, getting a sense of, or just doing like more summary things like this. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm explicitly creating a variable that's called AFGARS and it's just gonna be one for every value in AFGARS. So this is just kind of my way in R to keep track when we get to linking which records I could find in AFGARS um, that will be linked to NCANs. Um, so this I'm just creating as like a flag to myself to say, okay, in this, this is AFGARS data. And it's kind of silly within itself because they're all one and it's all AFGARS data, but it's going to be helpful when we get to linking. Um, so I'm going to run this. And I have gone through this, so I'm not going to do these summaries because I inevitably run out of time. So we're going to assume that worked well and keep moving. So we have our cleaned AFGARs and NCANs data. Notice I've called them AFGARs and NCANs too, 
Um, I like to just index by numbers and not overwrite things. Overwriting can lead to prob unanticipated problems and it's just best to reduce any potential errors. Um, so that's why I like to create new data and not just overwrite it. Um, okay. So we've cleaned the data and AFGARS is ready to go. AFGARS is one row per child, but NCANS, remember, is over five years. That's why we have like 2.5 million observations. That's a five years worth of data. And so now we need to summarize. We wanna summarize a child's five years of risk factors and maltreatment. And so we need to, understand what kind of summarization we want to do on each variable. And so what I mean by this is we know we want one row per child in the NCANs. And to do that, we need to summarize for each child. We need to, let's say a child shows up five years and they have information for each of the five years. We need to think of a way to reduce that five years of information to just one summary. So instead of you know five years of indicators, maybe they were removed in 2015 due to um, physical abuse and 2016 maybe due to neglect, maybe our summary variable just says, were they ever removed due to physical abuse or were they ever removed due to neglect? So these sorts of summaries where it's not year by year, but just, you know, were they ever, or what was the total number of times they were removed rather than a year by year um, view. Um, so that's what I mean by summary. And hopefully that makes sense. Cause some of this, I'm gonna dive into this code, which gets a little tricky. Um, so let's take it one step at a time. We have our NCANS2 data, which is cleaned. Um, I've, did most of the cleaning behind the scenes, but we replaced the missing values. And so what I'm telling R is, okay, take my clean data and group it by state and foster care ID. So group it, so use our data and we want to work with the child level. I've included state here. Um, it's kind of redundant. I could remove this. Um, I guess let's, I'm gonna keep it because I don't know if that's gonna break any code. Um, but it's redundant because state is found within state foster care ID. And so each foster care ID is unique within each state. Um, I think I just kept it because then it keeps the variable. So I'll get to that in a second. So we're, we want a group by child. So we're saying for each child, we want one row. We wanna summarize information by each child. So that's my group by statement. So I'm saying, okay, take my data. We're looking within each child. So R is gonna say, okay, for each foster care ID, I'm gonna look at the rows. So once we have per child, we're gonna summarize. So like I said, we're gonna summarize the last five years into one row of data. So. I've just picked out a few variables here. Um, if you wanted to use, it's a little tedious. So this is why it's helpful to identify variables that you will need and variables that you won't, because some of these pro some of these steps are a little tedious, um, including this summarize. So I've just included a few points of interest here. So instead of having each individual a year of the child, I said, okay, what is the first report within this five-year frame? Okay, so that's a summary value. So the year of their first report, which is taking the min. Okay, when was their last report or their most recent? Then we take the max. So again, think of R as looking at each child's piece of information. A child could have at least, could have a, sorry, a child could have a lot of rows in this data because they could be appearing multiple times within a year. So they could have five rows of data, one for each year. I mean, they could have like 10 rows of data if they're, they have multiple reports over the years. Um, so R is taking all that. So R is going child by child, you know, looking at the full extent per child, and now we're summarizing. So over the child's records, when was their first report? Min of, you know, the first year that's observed. When was the last report? Um, we can count the number of reports. So this n value is handy. This is just n and then open close parens. And this will tell you the number of observations 
in your group by statement. So this is telling you how many rows of data are you observing for each child in this five-year period. Um, child sex. So we usually default to taking min of child sex. Um, I'm just gonna breeze over that quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, so you could take the number of substantiated reports. Um, so this is saying if they were a victim, so you could show up on a report and not be a victim. So this is saying how many times were they a victim? So we're adding up the number of times they were observed to have been re a report victim. Um, and then uh, kind of in parallel, we could see the number of times they weren't a victim. Um, again, seeing if they've ever experienced parental abuse, the number of times um, the perpetrator is listed as a parent, um, the number of, if they've, or sorry, the number of times they've been re on reports due to neglect. So adding up the number of times that their maltreatment is listed as neglect. So that's saying the child maltreatment is equal to two or three, um, which if you look in our code book is equal to neglect. Um, and then, so if they've ever had a alcohol risk, I think this is their parent, if their parent has an alcohol um, risk factor. Um, and then this last one is our NCANS indicator, similar to our AFGARS up here. Um, I'm putting in this indicator for when we do get to linking uh, to keep track of um, where we could find each row of data, if it's in NCANS or AFGARS or both. So that this chunk of code is summarizing a child's experience over five years. Um, and I've definitely breezed through some of this, um, but the code is available and I'm available over email. So I'm just, it's gonna keep going. Um, and then this last piece I'm saying, okay, so we've summarized a child's experience over the five years. So now I'm saying mutate the variable if it's numeric, um, so that if it's missing to make it zero. I don't know why I did that. Um, I don't remember why I did that. I wrote this code a few months ago. I'm gonna breathe over that and just run this. Don't remember if, I don't think this is important. I think I might've just done that for preference. Um, Notice it's taking a while because R is going through each child, so each foster care ID and doing this summary. So it's kind of like if you were on a computer and looking up each kid and then summarizing. So R is like systematically going through each child um, and summarizing their experience in essence. Um, and this, again, notice this is like two and a half million observations. It's not a huge data set in terms of the big data world we live in today. And so this is taking a few minutes. Um, and this is why reducing your data filtering is gonna help computation. Because if we were looking, I think I had originally made this data more years, but it took way too long to run. Um, so like these computational uh, considerations are not, you know, not just to be ignored. Um, and so we can't do anything else until this stops running, but we can peek ahead. So that is still running. So we're collapsing our end cans. Sir, we have about two minutes till Q&A, FYI. Okay, um, that's running. Um, like I said before, we don't need to affect, we don't need to adjust AFGARS because we're only using one year of AFGARS and a child only appears once in a year in AFGARS. Um, I wrote here, don't need to change, but you should still double check. So again, checking. So we're grouping in AFGARS by the state foster care ID, and we're seeing how many are, how many observations per child, and then we could get a summary. And notice every child has one observation. So this is just, again, standing check. 
Okay, so notice it was all cleaning, all that. Now we're getting to linking. And as I said before, the reason I'm taking so long is because this is literally one line of code. So once your data is ready, you just need to tell R to join it up. So we're saying, okay, use my collapse data, full join with AFGARS, and you need to tell it by what? You don't necessarily do R can intuit, it'll find the same variables. Um, but sometimes it can find variables you don't mean to link on. So it's good to specify what you're linking by. So we're linking by child. So I'm gonna run this and that's it, we linked it. And so we can see how many successful links. So how many kids in NCANs could be found on AFRs or vice versa. So this is why I had these indicators. So we're saying which kids can be found in both data sets. And that's 70, about 70,000. So that's compared to our full AFGARS data. So that means 4,000 kids in foster care in 2020 did not have any previous records in NCANs that could be linked. That's what that means. Um, and as I was introducing the other ones, we have what we call the inner join. Um, and again, it's the same sort of syntax, but notice this inner join. So looking at here, inner link is only 70,000. So those were strictly 70,898. Those were strictly the only ones that could be found in both. Remember I said the inner keeps only what can be linked in both. Um, and then I guess I'll just put a pin in that. I mean, this is here just to see, just to get a sense of, well, let me, let me just run this actually. Um, this is to get a sense of how many observations in AFGARS can't be matched to NCANs. So that's about 3,500. 3, um, and then how many records in NCANs can't be matched to AFGARS is what I meant to write here. And that was a lot more because we had a lot more data, right? Um, so I'm just gonna resave this. So let me just stop there for Q&A. So I've answered a few of the questions um, written in the chat, including a question from Catherine about recommendations for software for using multiple years um, because of issues combining the size of the data. I recommended that it was probably not about software, but about computing power. And so to try and reduce the data as much as possible, you saw how much of Sarah's time went into that data cleaning and then using institutional computing power if you have access to it through either a VPN yeah. or a computer on campus. But we did have another question I was hoping well, you could I will answer. Say for that, I mean, some programming languages do handle bigger data sets better than others. I think SAS is probably like your, I don't know, not really gold standard. It's probably the best as far as the ones I listed to handle bigger data sets. R is probably on the, like the worst end of things. It can't really handle huge data sets. This is kind of pushing it to be honest so that's like a downfall of our downside i've never heard sarah give a downside of r so good job <laughs> catherine <laughs> um we have another question from abby do after data include every placement for children or does it include only placement information for children on the dates of reporting example march 30th or september 30th it will give the uh, most current placement as of the last reporting date. So as of the, whenever the last report came in and where the child was placed. So there was, there's really no information if they move around a lot, it's just gonna be the last placement by the time the report went in. That makes sense. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so we are at time, but I did want to highlight that next week, Dr. Frank Edwards from Rutgers is going to be coming in and link and doing a workshop about linking in DA CAM data. Um, you know, the same data sets you saw here today to external data. Um, and so that, you know, would be things like from the American Community Survey or uh, the census data. So um, if you're interested in linking, I recommend coming back next week to see that workshop as well. Um, and, you know, we're, we're always available via email and during the academic year during office hours. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Sarah, for that lovely presentation. Thank you. Here's uh, my email up again, just real quick before we all leave. And Aaron's too.
Yeah, if you have follow-up questions, let us know. We also have um, a formal technical support email, uh, which you can always send questions into as well if you're struggling with linking or coding. Um, and then we also, if you look at our website, have you know all the prior summer training series workshops on linking as well as some PDFs um, that give you kind of steps of linking and then code in different software. See y'all next week. Thanks, Aaron. The National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect is a collaboration between Cornell University and Duke University. Funding for NDA CAN is provided by the Children's Bureau, an office of the Administration for Children and Families.